Hello, and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I am your host, Bart Vanderzee, and this is a very special episode. Um, I'm joined by the foremost expert on Gene Krupa, Mr. Brooks Tegler. Brooks, how are you? How are you doing? Good to talk to you again, Bart. Good, yeah, you're the the first return uh, repeat um, guest on here, and I think it's perfect and very fitting that this is... Uh, this is a big one. So you've got you've got something that you want to share with the world, and I am beyond honored that I get to be the medium for you to uh, talk to people. So that's you, huge for me. You you get the scoop. I get the scoop. That's that's the way to put it. So right. Brooks, why don't we just uh, why don't you just why don't you start, man? Let's just let's just get right into it. So what is the scoop? Okay, the scoop is um, every group of fans' dream. Uh, or, well, I shouldn't say every, but at least it's always been mine. And um, my good friend Don McCauley, many will know Don, uh, works closely with uh, someone we all know by the name of Charlie Watts. And Charlie has uh, has a pretty, uh, well, there, there probably aren't words to describe. It's a very impressive collection of well-known vintage drums drum sets, drum equipment, recordings, et cetera, et cetera, from a lot of people that we all recognize their names as well. Of course, people like George Wetling and Dave Tuff and a few items uh, also that belong to Gene Krupa. Don called me several months ago, actually in October of last year, and invited me up to where he was so that I would have the honor of going through and cataloging a massive collection of stuff of genes that had been in storage since 1973. We're talking drums, sets, placards, trophies, uh, cymbals, trap cases, hmm. stands, you name it. Wow. You name it, and this was a, a, a great proportion of this stuff. Uh, is actually seen <clears throat> because it basically comprises just about everything that he used for the last six to eight years of his career. Wow. And to clarify, uh, in 1973, Gene passed away. So this would have been like, hey, here's his stuff. Let's put it in this storage unit and we'll figure it out later. And it sounds like no one figured it out until you guys came along. Well, Well, I think what happened was that it was, you know, of course, for a certain few, it had been known that it was there, and due to some life changes, et cetera, uh, some moving, some, you know, retirements, whatever you want to call it, um, the storage, the stuff in storage basically had to be moved, literally and figuratively. Um, the, the fact that it was all of a sudden for sale was a, a pretty closely guarded secret. Um, and basically, Charlie bought all of it. Oh, wow. And, yeah. Hmm. Uh, and he got quite a haul, frankly. Um, and it's just, it's, it, you know, it's very exciting to, to think about this stuff being out there. This is stuff that I and a million other people always assumed was long gone. Many people would have assumed that it burned up in a fire or yeah. was you know, sold at an auction. Um, it re I don't really have the backstory as to why the choices were made for why this went into storage. I'm guessing it went into storage in 73 before Gene passed away, huh. but perhaps because of the fire. Yeah. It was pulled out of the house. It was kept safe. The idea being, presumably, that it would come back out, and Gene passed away in October of that year and never actually used it. So it stayed there, hmm. uh, and it stayed there until last winter. So, you know, we're talking about a considerable amount of time. Wow. And as I said, when Gene was still working, many of the items that are in this collection, he was still using. Um and that included at least, there are at least three bass drums that people have seen hundreds of pictures of. Um, 
But there are some oddball items, too, some surprises. There were big surprises to me. Um, but when I started doing research, and I presented Charlie and Don with a 28-page report of everything that I'd found, uh, there, were some, there were some surprising things. Um, I actually had to eat my own words in one particular instance when someone had talked about a rumor that at one point Gene had a Rogers Dynasonic snare drum. Really? And wow. I would say, nah, that was just a myth, you know. Yeah, he's well, mis- Mr. Swingerland. It, wow. <laughs> it wasn't a myth. It was the truth. And it was not one, but two Dynasonics. He had a metal one, and he had a white marine pearl wooden one. Oh, man. And I'm sure, I'm sure that was, you know, influenced by Buddy, of course. Yeah. Um, but the truth is, unless you saw pictures of him playing this stuff, it's quite likely that he tried it out and didn't necessarily like it. There are two parade snares in that collection, one of which I know he did use. The other one he kept in his basement, but he never actually took it out. Were those Slingerland, what? the parade snares? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. just Everything. making sure. Other than the two Dynasonics, the only other non-Slingerland equipment that Gene ever had was the two Billy Gladstone snares that Billy gave him and the snares that Bobby Grosso made for him. However, the Grosso snares all had Slingerland equipment on them. In other words, the only thing that was really Bobby Grosso in those instances were the shells. Hmm. And most of those were prototypical shells because he had not even started fives yet and was just starting to experiment with fiberglass shells. So uh, I think he recalled making six or seven, seven or eight prototype snares and those were mostly for Gene, and most of those have just literally disintegrated Yeah. because the formula was not correct yet wow. for how to hold the fiberglass together. And he put all Slingerland hardware on them, uh, you know, some variation, but mostly zoomatics with, uh, you know, different butt ends, different parts. Um, so there aren't even many of those around anymore. I think I know of at least... Uh, there, there are probably four that I know that exist of the Grosso snares. None of those were in this collection, of course. Um, and I know that uh, my friend Joe Lanny owns one of the Grosso snares. Um, and <laughs> there are, you know, the, the, the quantity of stuff in this pile uh, is just remarkable because uh, they, this, these are working drum sets that Gene had. Yeah, well, let's um, let's pause for a sec, because to back up, I want to clarify. So when we're talking about Charlie Watts, in case no one knows, this is the absolute, you know, megastar drummer of the Rolling Stones. This is a massive drummer. So just if anyone didn't know that, that's who that is. And then to explain the fire, which I recommend you check out, uh, Brooks did a full episode with me on Gene's life, where there was a fire at his home, his, like, beloved home in Yonkers. Um, not sure what, what year was the actual fire... 73. So it was 73. in 73. So that was the year the year he died. Okay. So Yeah, and it wasn't it wasn't quite the massive fire that rumor has created yeah. to be. The fire the fire started in his den upstairs and really that was the extent of the massive damage of the fire. The smoke damage was a different consideration. But, sure. Um, you know, the it was not the the house burned down kind of story that people have have inflated that whole thing to be. No, but that would lead to then storing, th- putting some of this stuff into storage and all that. Um, but cool. I yeah. always like to make sure everyone's on the same page. Um, so I'd like to know, I think everyone would like to know, where was all this stuff when you actually first laid your eyes on it? It was in New England. Um, and, I, it, it, you know, because I like to respect people's privacy, sure. I, you know, it was the stuff had been moved from the storage facility to its next stop, and then the, the stop after that was actually Don's house, okay. which was particularly funny because they were all this stuff was just jammed into a small room at Don's house, hmm. and um, we you know we went through this uh, literally for me one piece at a time. But this is after Don, who really uh, I've known very few people in my career that work as hard as that guy. Hmm. Everything was individually wrapped, taped up, boxed, 
and moved to his house just, you know, just for that move. Everything was, you know, stuffed into a great big van. Wow. So, you know, he was extremely careful and then turned around and spent many days, I think, crating stuff to send over to London. Um, and just nonstop work. He does this all the time. He travels all over the world, and he oversees Charlie's collection in a in a way that most of us would dream, only dream about having somebody that was that dedicated yeah. to doing this stuff. Wow! And of course, he knows. You know, he knew what he was looking at when he found this stuff. Um, of course, so did Charlie, but Charlie didn't actually initially see it. So you know, Charlie relies heavily on Don yeah. to uh, to give him the information, which you know, I don't think he could find a more reliable guy for this stuff. So I was really honored when they when Don called me up and said, "Can you come up here and go through this stuff and you know offer whatever knowledge you know?" Yeah. Now, uh, what what did that look so, like? Like, what was your explain now a little bit about maybe maybe your role? Like, you you day one. Minute one, you're looking at it. What what did you first think? What what it was the first step to organizing all of this amazing history? Well, of course, I you know I, I wanted to just get my hands on things. Yeah, you know, I wanted to say, well, okay, yeah, well, this bass drum was this, so forth. But there's a lot of detail that I didn't have at my fingertips, literally or figuratively, mm-hmm. until I'd actually seen everything notated everything, gotten photos of it all, and then could sit down and start doing more intensive research. So the whole point for me was uh, was basically to go up and just look at everything in the same way that any museum curator would when sure. some big find came in. You know, there'd be a lot of people there that would be, they would look at everything, they would inspect everything, but at some point the serious cataloging had to begin. So... That's basically what I did. I spent a day up there going through everything, putting together a complete set in another room, which was I sent you a picture yes. of that. Yeah, I'll, once this is out, that drum set. we'll post that because it is just like, I mean, it made me happy well, to see that, to see you playing Gene's real drums. I mean, that's just so cool. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was, uh, you know, it was an indescribable feeling to be sitting behind that set after putting it together. Uh, you know, the nice part is there were other things about the, the collection, again, that were presumed to be gone. His last set of spotlights were there. They're red, um, right? Well, they're actually painted orange, but okay. they were painted over sometime in the last year or two because uh, another group of fans long time ago sent me a color shot of Gene playing up in New England. And there were the spotlights, but they'd been painted orange. Hmm. So why they were painted orange, have no idea. Still trying to figure that out. Wow. Um, but there they were. I mean, these are the spotlights that were in use by Gene. That particular model, those particular lights, they, Gene had been using those for 30 years or so. Um, they were the last model of spotlights out of three that he actually used. So, I mean, just the history was all over the place. Um and the set that we built in another another room of Don's house, just for pictures, was the set that included the 24-inch bass drum. That's the picture that I sent you. Yeah. 20, inch, 20 by 20 floor tom, 16 floor tom, 13 mounted tom, and the the only 5.5 by 14 Slingerland snare that was included. Um, Gene also had a tendency to give stuff away. Really? Yeah, uh, especially later in life. Yeah, yeah, he would give stuff to, like, the local church, uh, the local school connected to the church. That stuff went up for auction several years ago. Hmm. Um, but, yeah, he would send stuff to people. Uh, the, the the very first bass drum that I ever authenticated was a 14 by 26 Radio King bass drum that Gene had sent to a bartender friend that he met out in Las Vegas. Because the guy asked him, he said, you know, Gene, do you ever, like, you know, give drums away? And <laughs> lo and behold, months later, this 26-inch bass drum shows up at this guy's front door. Wow. And he used that He used that as an end table for years. You oh, know. my gosh. That I would have had a problem with, but what can you say? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it, it pays to just start asking people, hey, do you ever give this away? <laughs> I gotta start doing that. <laughs> really? Well, it might work. You never know. No. All right. So you're you're making me think. Um, all right. When we're looking at this collection 
in the world of drums, I guess let's just say in the world of Gene Krupa, like how many existing Gene Krupa full drum sets are out there? How rare is this in the big picture of uh, drums? Strangely enough, this is actually the only complete set. Oh my God. And the, yeah, the, everything else is just pieces. Uh, there are lots of people out there who think they have a Gene Krupa drum set, but the fact is they don't. Uh, again, a lot of that stuff was given away, but Gene used a lot of that stuff until it fell apart. Um, you know, much to the consternation of Slingerland, they always wanted to have new stuff. Wow. Um, by the very end, by, you know, the time, the first time that Gene retired was 67. Mm hmm. And he he pretty much given up, you know, played badly or thought he played badly, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Came out of retirement in 1970. So much of this equipment is stuff that he acquired then. And it was also, according to somebody who knew him and was with him at the time, was stuff that they sent him, even though the association with Slingerland had pretty much fizzled out. Yeah. Um, they sent him new stuff. And if he asked for something, they would still send him something. He was still, he was still the main guy for the company. He just sure. wasn't appearing on uh, catalog covers anymore. So, but that's that's why, that's why this is really the only complete collection of that would make up a whole set. Now, if you have to put a year on it, so are you saying these drums were like 1970 Slingerlands because they look like a classic kind of, uh, you know, Radio King set. But so what year, what did you date the actual drum set to? Well, the latest stuff, the newest stuff that's there was uh, probably between 68 and 70. Um, the oldest stuff there, probably the oldest drum, is one 9 by 13 Radio King mounted tone. Why that one stayed there, I don't know. Um, but, yeah, the bulk of the equipment... Uh, is 60s into the early 70s. Probably the last thing he got was a uh, 12 by 15 TDR uh, parade snare hmm. because of the TDR 100, 100 was actually introduced in the 73 catalog. So he got that, according to sources, he got that particular parade snare with the TDR throw off sometime around 72. And then again, that was probably a prototypical drum. So, and the, the, uh, according to the reports I got, he didn't really like it that much. Yeah. So. Well, but it's like you think of anyone with like, you're kind of saying like, I don't know why he had it, but you think to anyone who has like a drum room, and I'm I'm like thinking, I, you know, you have an old broken cymbal hanging on the wall that it's just cool to have. So I'm sure he might have just been yeah. like, well, this is just a neat drum, and he's the he's Mister Drum, so like just have it have it around. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. Certainly, and the earlier parade snare that he did, in fact, use, he recorded with it. Wow. He recorded with that when he when he did the Percussion King project. Jeez, um, wow. So, and used that uh, probably more than once. He may have actually used it when he did the record with Louis Belson in the early 60s, too. Hmm. But no. that one is, is late 40s, early 50s vintage, uh, in beautiful shape. Um, but, uh, of course, you know, generally speaking, Gene didn't, do much with parade snare drums, so not much there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the late '60s. Uh, you can see the bass drums in hundreds of pictures. Uh, the the oldest of the '60s, I believe, it's just my opinion, was his very first 14 by 22 inch bass drum, which he picked up in 1962 hmm. when he ordered uh, a whole bunch of new stuff. He literally ordered everything. Uh, including sticks and brushes. Wow. And that's when he picked up this drum. He had other 22s that he used, you know, during that period, all the way up until the last one he got, which I believe was in 68, 69. That is the very last bass drum that he actually plays on in public. Jeez. And you can see him using that bass drum and that set. The Tom Toms were the same ones you saw in the picture I sent. Yeah, uh, those are the same drums that you see him playing at, at the, all of the Goodman Quartet reunions, uh, including the one at Carnegie Hall. It's those drums, two canister thrones. Oh, really? Wow, that's uh, neat. That's a that's yeah, a, yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, so you're getting into so. First thought is it's amazing. It's kind of similar to finding someone's first drum set. Is this is the last drums this this 
icon owned. I mean, that's just massive. Right. But you're, you're, what, yeah. what, what I want to know is, um, and hopefully it can be kind of in an entertaining way and not just reading a list, but is there a way we can just kind of quickly go down the list of everything that was in that, uh, in the hall without it being too, you know, I'm just reading a list. Well, uh, yeah, well, it, actually, yes, there is, because I plan to, when we Excellent. air this, when you air this, I will coordinate putting my 28-page report up on my own blog page. Awesome. Which in, includes details, and it also includes photographs. Okay. Um, part of the problem with this stuff is, this is really important stuff. Yeah. Uh, not just new merchandise for everybody. Sure. Um, so I've tried to stress as, as strongly as I can that this is not stuff that's just going to be available for anybody with the right amount of money. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not for sale, I guess is the point. And it's also not, people have to, you know, keep in mind there are plenty of people that have, that have put together bogus, phony group of stuff for years. You know, tried to palm off sets as being one that Gene had. Yeah. Of course, it's for anybody who knows much about that kind of thing. It's easy to, to easy to prove that they weren't. Well, the same thing with this stuff. It's going to be marked accordingly. And you know, if somebody five years from now wants to put up a drum that they found claiming that it was something from this collection there's going to be a specific mark on that drum in a place that only those who know would be able to find. And if that mark is not there, then those people are lying. I yeah. mean, mostly because, you know, there are collectors out there and there are wheeler dealers. And this stuff is, well, like I said, it's not for sale anyway. Charlie, you know, Charlie has this stuff for his own collection. That, but that was my um, question was, okay, so it's not for sale. This is Charlie's, um, which, oh, man, I bet he's got an amazing drum room, drum warehouse of just this gear. So yeah, where, warehouse is more to the point. Wow. And so it's not for sale. It is, it is a, I mean, we're, we're talking about Charlie Watts collection of the last gear that Gene Krupa owned in his, in his life. Yeah. You're not going to get yeah. this on eBay. No, you're definitely not. And the fact is Charlie has himself has shared stuff from his collection with other people. That's, that's his choice. It's his decision. Sure. Um, you know, what he does with the stuff. Um, and if some of this stuff becomes available, it's going to be through channels that are not just the usual stuff. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. You know, I, I, I think there, I mean, even Charlie has to be practical about what he keeps. And I'm guessing when all is said and done, because a lot of this is still being discussed, a lot of it's still being mulled over, there's going to be stuff that Charlie's probably not going to have any interest in at all. Uh, you know, I mean, he's got, he's got a, he's got a huge building of drum history already. Hmm. Um, you know, does he need three of the same thing? Probably not. Now, does he have any uh, other uh, Gene Krupa memorabilia already? He did have some stuff. I believe he had, uh, actually, you know, I don't even know specifically. I think sure. he had one snare drum. <clears throat> that belonged to Gene, wow. uh, or was said to belong to Gene, and a couple other small items. I know that he's got some some masters of some of the records that Gene did. Cool. Um, but truth truth be told, and a lot of that stuff has not really been reliably available. Uh, you know, it's like that ill-fated Radio King snare drum that for years was supposedly one that belonged to Gene. It never came near Gene. Uh, unfortunately, now it actually belongs to another famous drummer who still thinks it belongs to Gene. Oh, God. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> well, funny. the sad thing is that, you know, that kind of stuff is contagious. And, you know, this apparently was given to the guy as a gift and still carries this mythological idea that it belonged to Krupa. It never did. Hmm. And the whole, you know, the whole commentary about supporting that claim is grossly flawed. But, you know, that's for another time. Yeah. The stuff that I'm talking about now is the real article, the genuine article. The real deal. Um, yeah, it certainly is. So I have a question yep. for you, and I know it's kind of an awkward question, but I feel like I everyone wants me to, everyone would want to know, do you know what Mr. Charlie Watts paid for this entire collection? Is that something that's available to uh, 
to the drum history fans? That that the information uh, is not something I would ever be able to talk about if I knew. Sure, I'm sure it was a lot. <laughs> yeah, I bet, but, man. I mean, you can't uh, can't blame a guy for asking, but that's um. Well, you know, I mean, considering what the stuff is, considering the the fact that it exists at all. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's pretty valuable stuff, you know, in the same way that, you know, as soon as somebody shoved over that last brick and all of a sudden realized they just opened up Tut's tomb. Exactly. Um, you know, they got, they got, then they got to figure out a way to get that stuff back and protect it. Yeah. Same it's thing al- for this stuff. It's almost <clears throat> priceless, you know. I'm, of course, there's a price, and I'm sure he, he paid it, but it is, it is, it is such iconic and, and just, I mean, it has this... I'm jealous, man, that you got to play this stuff. <laughs> That's just so cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm I'm very lucky. I mean, Don's a great guy. Charlie Charlie also a great guy. Good people and you know, I just got lucky that um whatever knowledge I had about Gene, you know, afforded me the opportunity. And it was just great. I mean, I was pretty much breathless the whole time. Yeah, I bet. You know, going through this stuff, including, I mean, there are four trap cases up there. And, you know, stuff in them. You know, just thinking about the, you know, okay, Gene was digging through this trap case on this gig. And, you know, you couple that with so much of the actual anecdotal history about where Gene was, what he was doing. Yeah, you know the story about the at the end of the Carnegie Hall Goodman Quartet reunion, where Gene was so exhausted that he could not even get up off of the canister throne he was sitting on. Hmm. So everybody came or grouped around him, and there's a classic picture of him sitting there, supporting himself a little bit. But there's Benny standing right behind him. Wow! All of those drums are in this collection. Oh my God! Every one. Wow. You know, and it's, you know, talk about, talk about putting some meat on the bones of a story. Good grief. Yeah, I bet. I mean, when you, including this room. when you walk into the room, there has to be just all of your senses. This, I mean, really the smell of this kind of like this classic gear that has to be just, it yeah. just takes your brain there. Wow. Um, yeah. Yeah. Geez. And you think about all of the stuff that you read or that you hear about the gene experienced at any given time and you know you're still talking about a regular guy yeah who carried his stuff in put his drums together himself so you know he's all over these drums it's not as though these were there when he got there you yeah know, these were in the back these are in the back of some station wagon uh the classic anecdotes about him playing the the concert at the new school with eddie condon and wild bill yeah um, the stories about how that was over. My good friend, who was there, a guy named Ken Spence, and him talking about his long conversations when everything is over, and I could just imagine it, an empty hallway in a school, and there's Gene waiting for the car, and he's by himself. He's standing there, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, all of that stuff just kind of creates a just a marvelous image of, of where this stuff was, what it did, you know. And there were, like I said, there were some, you know, some interesting surprises. Yeah, what, um, what, I mean, so expand on the surprises a little bit more. I mean, you're talking bass drum pedals. Besides that particular, that earlier, um, was there anything that just really shocked you or you didn't expect to find or you found Gene's tuning keys or? Well, actually, uh, yeah, there were plenty of those. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't lose his no. tuning key. He's the only drummer in the world. <laughs> no, he, he, he had lots of them. And he had, some, he had some curious things. Like, he had some, I couldn't even figure out what brand it was, curious uh, cymbal stand in one of the trap cases. I still don't know what kind it was, but it was partially blue metal. Wow. Um, but it definitely wasn't a Slingerland item. Um the Dynasonics, of course, because the the oddest thing about the Dynasonics was they took a page from Bobby Grosso's book in that they put Slingerland lug casings on them. Hmm. But all the other parts are all 100% Rogers. So, wow. you know, they weren't, they weren't fooling anybody. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> you know? uh, so you, you just, yeah. you kind of went down that path. Was that to make it so Gene could use it live and on recordings and still stay true to Slingerland, try and kind of the Buddy Rich thing where he's he's kind of trying to hide it. Truth be told, I couldn't tell you. Okay. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. It's not as though they were, 
not going to be blatantly obvious Dinosonic Rogers drum. Yeah, with the rail and... Um, you know, I mean, uh, probably from 30 feet away, they would just look like another snare drum and no one would care. Yeah. And I believe I found one photograph of Gene actually using the metal one. Hmm. But even that, you know, even that's going to be, you know, one person's interpretation or another. Yeah. Um, but I think it was one of those things where he was intrigued by it. He wanted to try it out. I mean, you know how things go like that. Somebody walk up with a Dynasonic under their arm and go, Gene, I've always loved you. Here, take this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know? totally. And and there's there's Gene walking home with a Dynasonic snare. Or he may have asked for it. I don't know. But they were all kind of rough and dirty. And there was this curious kind of folded paper muffler on the top head of the wooden one. Wow. And it was obvious that whatever they were, it was something Gene was sort of futzing around with, but never actually did anything with. Hmm. Uh, much like much like the Grosso, no, the uh, Gladstone snares, Gene loved those drums, just loved them. But the classic story is that the, his Black Diamond Pearl snare wound up at Frank's shop, drum shop in New York, where all of Gene's stuff would go. Hmm. And somebody started changing things around. When Gene found out about that, he was incensed because they'd, they'd taken off the original gut snares and put wire, et cetera, et cetera. But the fact is, the drum was at Frank's drum shop. It was not in Gene's basement. Uh, it, you know, it ultimately wound up there, but yeah. as did this stuff. And anybody who wants to see some of this stuff in action, <clears throat> again, you can look at a number of videos, but there's also, there was a documentary called Born to Swing, which I believe was uh, narrated by uh, now deceased Andre Previn, if I'm not mistaken. Anyway, it was done by Al uh, uh, was it Albert McCarthy? Oh, Anyhow, sure. yeah, you can see much. You can see much of this stuff in the clips of Gene in his basement. Wow! Because this was stuff that was set up in his basement that he played on all the time. Now, when you talked about the Dinosonics and the and the and the, the the dustiness of them, what are we talking about? as far as the condition of everything was, was it in great shape, brand new, good, you know, how, how did it look? Uh, really depended on the particular drums, the bass drums, the early 62 model, which had a very famous front head on it. Um, <clears throat> but actually a front head that was not, it did not share the same history as the drum itself, but it was, I'm sure put on there because Gene wanted to keep the front head and wanted to keep the drum. Um, <clears throat> that one was kind of well used, I guess would be the right point. Okay. Um, you know, uh, the rims, a lot of the paint chipping and, and, you know, not horrible, you know, it was not as though it had been sitting in a junkyard. It was just well used, uh, not, you know, not shiny and gleaming. Yeah, really. Um, and then the, the 24 inch bass drum much better shape because it was much newer uh, and didn't get the use that the 22s did, although it was used quite a lot. For some reason, it was in much better shape. That was one, the one in the picture. Yeah. And then the other 22, which was the very last one that he used, was in pretty, pretty nice shape. Uh, you know, front head was good. Everything else was good. Things were still shiny. Uh, you know, badges were in the right place, et cetera, et cetera. That was another thing is that, you know, you're never going to be able to fake these drums, at least for the for the bass drums and the snare drum, because they have serial numbered badges. Yeah, really. So, um, uh, so yeah, the, those things were in pretty good shape. The parade snares were, of course, in very nice shape because they hardly got used. The Dynasonics, for some reason, were dusty. Uh, chrome was really cloudy. Hmm. So, you know, who knows where they came from? Maybe someone else out there has some anecdote about where Gene got these. Uh, don't know if they do. I wish I'd, you know, I wish they'd get in touch with me. I'd love to know. That's the main thing with all this stuff is, you know, there are people out there who did know Gene or they, you know, they know a story of Gene. Um, and, you know, it would be nice that all of that actually came together. Yeah, well, I, and I'm working on that angle too, but that's a that's a different podcast. Yeah, um, well, I'm just glad in general <laughs> it, you, you didn't find it, and it was like, you know, the the roof had caved in and smashed it all, and it was like, well, this was Gene's yeah. drum set. <laughs> it's now it's yeah. a bunch of wood, but yeah, that's great. Absolutely, and I, yeah, truth be told, I think the people the people knew that they had something really important. 
Yeah. And, you know, for, for all intents and purposes, there may be more of it out there, but I kind of doubt it. Hmm. Uh, okay. I mean, I, I have authenticated quite a few drums that belonged or, in fact, didn't belong to Gene. But you never know. I mean, the the little 5x10 Tom Tom that Gene used with his very first Goodman Trio set, who would have ever thought that that thing would pop out of nowhere? But it did a few years back. Really? So, you know, there may be more stuff. But this stuff is just remarkable because it's it's all identifiable. You know, it's all, yeah, you can look at a picture of that 14 by 22 and go, okay, it's there. It's the same drone. Mm-hmm. You wow, know? yeah. Um, and and the, the lights and everything. And it's just unbelievable. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I, I love the stuff like the, the spotlights and you know, even the bass drum pedals. I mean, there were several uh, super speed pedals there, and I don't think Gene ever used them. Um, and he, I know that he used Tempo Kings, and of course he used, for most of his career, he used Epic pedal. Hmm. Wow. But, you know, um, obviously Gene got a lot of stuff just to try out, and chances are a lot of it was just sent to him. You know, uh, who knows whether he asked for it or not, but... I believe that Slingerland for a long time would send him stuff and say, can you try this out? Can you use this? Can we take pictures of you? Whatever. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, wow. You know, he was, he was quite loyal to the company. I just think it's important to like what you taught me and I, I kind of already knew, but what you taught me was just the, the, he's just such a nice guy. He was a gentleman. He was a, just a kind person and I'm sure he would be happy to when people sent him this stuff and he probably just kept it and said of course you know I'm not gonna throw I guess he would give it away to churches and stuff but um it right. just it just builds yeah. that character up even more of just being a being a good guy yeah I, I agree with that I completely agree he was a very gracious man and you know would go about things with a lot of class um, not to say that Gene, you know, didn't have his opportunities to show that something bugged him, but sure, um, yeah, you know, a lot of a very, very gracious guy. Uh, plus, the fact that a lot of this stuff may have been things that most people never saw because of the drum school. It's like the things that were auctioned off by Skinner several years ago. Most of that stuff actually was at the drum school, not in Gene's basement. Until he finally got it back when the drum school ended, and, you know, there he was. But uh, So that stuff he happily would give away, because he wasn't using it. He didn't need it. Um, and, you know, all of the stories about things like people would say, well, why don't you just get Slingerland to do such and such? And Gene would say, well, because I don't need that, you know? Yeah. Um, instead of... Instead of getting a complete set of drums from Slingerland, he would just ask for a bass drum. Really? And, you know, I've heard the story that, you know, somebody said, Gene, why don't you just ask him to send you a whole set? And his reply would be, I don't need a whole set. You know, I've got everything else I need right here. So, same thing with cymbal. Uh, you know, there were there were uh, interesting anecdotes that I dug up about certain cymbals that were in this collection. When he came out of retirement in 1970, Armand Zildjian just sent him a set of Zildjian, of Zildjian symbols that I don't think he ever used. But Armand, keeping the family tradition, because they were very close. He was yeah. very close to Avidus. And, you know, they just they wanted to contribute when Gene made it clear that he was coming back out of retirement. So they just sent this stuff to him. You know, you don't do that with people who are jerks. <laughs> no, no, and it makes it makes as far me, as I have. No, you don't. But it it makes me think too. G Gene coming up in that kind of uh, depression era of I'm going to keep what works, and I don't want to pay. I don't want to buy yes. something else. And I think that probably in in a lot of people's lives um, translates to no. I you, we'll fix it. We don't need to buy something new. We'll fix this. Or I like my toms. Absolutely. Give me the new bass drum. I'll I'll you know switch it out right. and, and do that. So that's that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, no question about it. I mean, Gene had a very, very strong work ethic. Uh, you know, even when he was playing with Goodman, he would take gigs with other bands. You know, once in a while, you'd hear about him playing with some other band. I mean, that was in the, the height of the, the the rising popularity of Goodman's band. Wow. But Gene needed to work. He needed to play. You know, he was a newly married young guy. and needed <laughs> He needed to make money. So, yeah, and that continued his whole life. Married his telephone operating um, 
Bride, as you can find out about yeah. in the previous episode, uh, all about Gene Krupa, which, I mean, I... I think I think I feel like we're all lucky to be able to hear this from you, who I think is just the guy that everyone looks at. Um, why don't you, unless you can think of some other little tidbits, Brooks, why don't you share with people where they can find you? And I will obviously share a link to the um, to the the document you're going to give me access to and, and the whole world. So, yeah, where where do people find you? I'm an old guy. Uh, Bart, so <laughs> I don't actually I don't actually remember. It's it. I have a blog site on uh, WordPress, and I believe it's I labeled it Gene Krupa and his scuff or something sure. quite like that. But what I, I will send it to you once I'm sitting in front of my computer, so that it makes sense. And I will share it. Um, sure. Okay. Yeah, that would be good. It's something like that. Um, it's a twenty eight. It's a twenty eight page thing, but it includes pictures. That is um, awesome. Man. We are beyond lucky to be able to hear this about, uh, well, I guess Charlie Watts is the lucky fella here who gets to own this stuff. And I, I just imagine him going into his drum, let's say warehouse, <laughs> like I would do. And <laughs> you just stand there and look at it and you just, you know, have a drink yeah. or whatever. And you're just looking at this stuff and just, just touching it. And, you know, yeah. I think he would appreciate it. And it's, it's not going to some guy who is trying to then auction it off in 10 years and get rich off of it. Cause yeah. I don't think he needs right. to. Absolutely. He's doing okay. So absolutely. And I, and I, I truly believe that that was a lot of the motivation for Charlie was to preserve it. Yeah. To keep it from just becoming auction father. Yeah. Um, you know, as I believe he's done with many others, um, uh, his heart is definitely in the right place about vintage drums and vintage drummers. You know, he, he knows he definitely is in the right spot there. And, you know, thank, thank goodness he's in a position to do it. Because if he wasn't, I seriously doubt anyone else would step up to that plate. He's a very unique person in that regard. Um, yeah. You know, that he's willing to do that. I mean, obviously, you know, he's made some money in his career. <laughs> a little bit, yeah, I <laughs> you know, think so. Based on his interest in also horses and and his car collection which are also pretty impressive, but, you know, uh, I, I'm going to forever be grateful that between the, the work that Don does and Charlie's dedication to it, this stuff is going to be safe, you know, That's for great. a long time. That's awesome. So, Well, yep. I am uh, beyond honored that you would uh, give us the scoop and uh, reveal this here <laughs> and... Um, just well, so cool. I think you guys do beautiful work. I think what you do is great, and I really think that, uh, you know, it needs to happen more, and it, it, more people need to know about it, um, because I think it's very cool. Um, that's great. What you're up to here. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. It's a, it's a labor of love at this point, and I'm, uh, I'm, I'm having a lot of fun, and uh, it is just such a cool way to connect with people such as yourself and um, have the opportunity to learn and we're, we're doing it all together. Well, I think there probably are about 12 people in the world who knew about this until now. Wow. That's um, amazing. So, so, yeah. Cool. And I did talk to Don about doing it this way, and he said, yeah, sounds like a great idea. Well, so, you know. Amazing. Um, I got full clearance. That's great. And, you know, yeah, you, you got the scoop, you know. I got, you got the, the scoop. Headline. Now we just got to make sure, uh, and, we got to send the link to Charlie and see if Charlie can listen to it. That'd be the ultimate uh, <laughs> goal to have a Rolling Stone listen. Well, the other nice thing is that Don is also a technical wizard. So once he knows that it's actually coming out, he'll I'm sure he'll, he'll be able to get to it right away. Cool. Um, That's great. Well, Brooks... Man, I mean, again, thank you, my friend. I will have the link shared uh, in the description of this episode, and I'll post some photos. And I just think keeping the 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 legend of Gene Krupa alive is a just an awesome thing, and I'm happy to be a part of it in any way. Well, my, my pleasure, and I'm glad you're there to do it. Awesome. So we'll we'll keep working at it. All right, Brooks. And thanks. Yeah, we'll keep in touch, brother. I'll talk to you later. Okay, man. Take care. All right. Bye bye. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning. This is a Gwyn Sound Podcast.